All right, let's turn to Jeremiah 20. I've got a few things to share. And then um, at the end, we're doing an altar call. And we have some people. Heather Gillies is going to help out and, and Jane. And uh, I've asked a few others already in advance. And can someone please forewarn Mitzi? And I want the kids to come down. We need to lay hands on the kids. So when it's time for service to be over, Junior Church needs to be down here. And we want to pray for uh, them as well. I want to pray about the fire of God. Amen? Amen? We need our soul on fire in these days. Yes. need our soul on fire every day, but certainly in these days. So, um, Jeremiah chapter 20, <coughs> verse 9 to 11. We've got three scriptures this morning all talking about fire, but this is the one that kind of kicked it off, and then I'm going to focus on... Uh, One in Ezekiel, but for now, let's read this one. Then I said, I will not make mention of him, capital H, but his word, nor speak any more in his name, but his word was like, was in my heart like a burning fire, shot up in my bones. I was weary of holding it back, and I could not hold it back. But his word was in my heart like a burning fire, shut up in my bones. And I was weary of holding it back. And I'm going to add to here, and I no longer could. His word was in my heart like a burning fire, shut up in my bones. See, when the Lord begins to speak to you, whether in Scripture or prophecy or dreams or visions, it will burn in your heart. And it's interesting. I'm going to give you kind of a quick synopsis of this chapter, but... Um, we were talking Wednesday night about uh, Wycliffe and Martin Luther and uh, John Gus and how they suffered. And it's interesting how many people, when God begins to move, how many people suffer at the hands of the church. Religion does not do well when God begins to move. So be careful when you say to your friends and they say you're religious. You're not religious. I'm born again. I have a relationship And yes, I go to church, but I am not religious. Religion kills. And in verse 1, it says, uh, The priest who who was the chief governor in the house of the Lord, he was the chief priest, heard Jeremiah prophesying these things, and he struck him in the mouth and threw him in the stockade. Religion rises up when the word of the Lord comes forth. And I hate to tell you, but even on a good day, we all have a little religion in us. And we don't like to admit it, but there are certain times all of a sudden you'll find yourself a little bent on something and you're going, why am I so concerned about that? And, we'll go, and that's religion. We all carry some of it from our culture, from our heritage, whatever it is. So he begins to talk to God and he says, God, you know, I've been prophesying these things, these things you've told me. I've been speaking your word and I've been speaking exactly what you told me to do. And look where I am. I'm in the stocks, or for most of us, we know the stockade probably better. What is going on here? Am I not doing your word? Am I not prophesying in your name? And Jeremiah is really upset here. I'm being beaten, I'm being spit upon. And I don't know if you've not watched some of those Robin Hood movies and stuff, but when they're in stockades, they're throwing tomatoes and garbage and spitting on them. It's not a very popular place to be. But he says, you know what? I'm not going to speak of you anymore. And I'm not going to speak in any more in your name. I'm not going to speak for you. But. But your word is burning in my heart. And it's like a fire. And it's in my bones and I've shut them up, but I, I've got to let it go. I can't hold it back. It's burning a hole in me. I have to let go the word of the Lord. And so it will be with us. I can't keep quiet. So he is trying to be, he doesn't want to be involved. He's very reluctant to join in with the work of the Lord. I've been abused, I've been beaten, I've been uh, the very ones in the church who I'm speaking to the church, but the church rises up and throws me in the jail. But deep inside, there's a pressure that was building. Those of you who prophesied know what that's about. All of a sudden, your heart starts to do flips. Your stomach starts to turn. You just, oh, what is this about? That's the pressure. That's the presence of God. Something's about to happen. 
He's tired of being tempted to preach and tired of being rejected. It was painful. You read many of those prophets. It was not an easy life. However, he can't stop because it's burning within him. It's the fire of God. It's the word of life. It's the word of correction to the people. And it burned within him so much it it tormented him. It just caused him to reluctantly begin to speak again because he can't hold it back. He had to go on preaching because it was burning up inside of him. He says, I'm weary, I'm tired, but I can't hold it back. God's word has such a powerful presence and such a pressure. It'll be just like a pressure cooker. As God begins to work on our heart, all of a sudden, boom, it begins to go. And it increases, it doesn't decrease. Bruce was telling me they're collecting sap from the trees and they get this big pot, but by the time they boil it down, there's not much left. A lot of work for a little bit, but it's good. When God begins to burn, his pot overflows. There's increase in his pot. In man's, there's decrease, but with God, there's increase. There's power and anointing in the name of Jesus. There's, there's something that begins to happen. Our zeal will increase. Our passion will increase for the glory of God. And I like this part that he had to press on. It reminded me of the topic of last week. There are times that we must press on and have that face of flint, that forehead of flint. We must press on in the things of God. When he's laying it on our heart, as Jane was talking about in Sunday school, maybe we need to go and talk to someone. Maybe we have a burden for one of our neighbors. Maybe we're, we're told to go and pray in the supermarket for that lady. But whatever it is, when it begins to burn up within you, you need to let it go. But the Lord, look at verse 11. But the Lord is with me as a mighty awesome one, capital O. I don't like the NIV sometimes because they don't always put the capitals where they should be. But the Lord, capital L, awesome one, capital O, meaning God. Therefore, my persecution, I will, my persecutors will stumble and will not prevail. They will be greatly ashamed, for they will not prosper. And their everlasting confusion will not be forgotten. God gives a promise to you that he will be with you, that he will walk with you, and that, yes, you will face opposition, but you will walk with the overcoming God, and he will allow you to overtake them. Amen? Let's turn to Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3. All three scriptures are going to be dealing with fire here this morning. Matthew 3 verse 11. This is John the Baptist talking. Remember he was a one man, one sermon man. Repent and be baptized. Next Sunday, repent and be baptized. Third Sunday, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Be baptized. Verse 11, though, he begins to flow prophetically. I indeed baptize you with water for repentance. But he, capital H, who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit And fire. I am not worthy to carry, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Jesus was coming and he was going to release a baptism. The Holy Spirit was going to be released, that helper, and the the baptism of fire which comes upon us to uh, change us on the inside, change our mind, change our hearts, change our actions. He begins to remove things out of our lives things that we used to like, and all of a sudden we, we find a dislike because God's increasing. And the things we used to like are decreasing because God is slowly burning them up. The closer you you are to God, the less of man will be influenced in your life. The closer you are to God, those things will begin to burn up and go away. And all of a sudden you'll find yourself, why am I not doing those things? Because your passion has been changed. Your heart has been changed. Your desire and your goals have been changed. Because God has got a hold of you. We need to be like Jesus, bearing a life of fruit like he bore. And mostly he bore it out of love and out of compassion. 
Boy, if you have a great love for God, you'll have a great love for people. If you have a great love for people, you'll have a compassion for those that are unsaved. And you'll want to see them saved. You'll want to see them healed. You'll want to see them delivered. You'll want to see them changed forever. That would be a good time to go, amen. Are we tired of having a cold or lukewarm heart toward God? Question for you this morning, don't raise a hand. Are you comfortable this morning? We get comfortable in church. We get comfortable at work. We get comfortable in whatever we're involved in. We can get comfortable. Being comfortable doesn't mean you're always going to be profitable. Being comfortable doesn't mean you're always going to press on. People who press on, people who win medals, people who win games, people who have... Uh, overcoming the business world and whatever else are not comfortable people. They're antsy. They're always looking for something better, some, a new idea, a different vision. Right, Ryan? The source of the inward fire is the love of God. And that love is poured out by His Holy Spirit. See, we need to love on God, and sometimes we think that's all we have to do. We need to love on God. We need to love this Word. This Word needs to be burning up in us, like with Jeremiah. It needs to be burning us. But there's so much more than that because it is a free gift. We learned that on Wednesday night. Martin Luther worked so hard. It said, uh, I forget how the quote went, but he said, If anybody else can get to heaven by being the best monk, it's me. I've out monk- I think it was monkery. I've done more monkery than everybody. He had crawled on the steps, fasted and prayed. He had done all he could to get to heaven. And then he read Romans and found out it was a free gift. I'm justified by faith. It is a free gift. And one thing I didn't know, uh, we were reading about, we learned about it uh, Wednesday night. And those of you who've been to university know it's a, what a thesis is. It means you are prepared to defend it in front of a panel, usually of two to three people. We've all heard that Martin Luther nailed some papers to the door. Do you know that it was 95 finished thesis? And that he was willing to, what he was saying by nailing them to the public door. I will debate anybody publicly over any of these things. Baptism, salvation, justification. I will debate anybody in the church in the town over these. I will stand in front of a committee and defend these truths that the Lord has shown me. That's what the Holy Spirit can do in the time of revelation in the private times. That that fire will burn within you. And that's what happened to Jeremiah. That fire began to burn in him. We need to be pressing toward the heart of God. We need to be setting ourselves with an open heart. Asking God just to open us up in new ways and new visions. The cross, which often is like a lens to us. It can, it can refine, focuses the love of God back to the point God died for us. And it's the same with the Holy Spirit. I will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And that was a declaration of what was declared by the prophet Ezekiel. So let's turn there. Ezekiel chapter 37. Ezekiel chapter 37. Very familiar passage of scripture. It's about the valley of dry bones. Ezekiel 37. And I'm going to read. Oh, what am I going to read? I'm going to kind of bop around. We'll start at verse 1. I'm going to kind of hit highlights. But I want to get down to verse 14. Then the hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me in by the Spirit and set me down in a valley of dry bones, valley in the middle of a valley, and it was full of bones. There we go. And he caused me to pass by them, begin to see them, see what was going on. And they were very dry, meaning they were dead beyond dead. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? If you don't know the answer, this is the answer you should give. Only you know, Lord. And then he said to me, prophesy to, prophesy to these bones 
and say, Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord to the bones, Surely I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. Verse 7, So I did as I was told, I prophesied, I commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise. Why was there a noise? Because he was obedient to what the Lord had told him to do. When the Lord gives you a dramatic word, step out in faith and speak what you're given. It wasn't that he began to speak and it wasn't the words. It was because he was obedient to the word of the Lord. As I prophesied, as I was commanded, there was a noise. Verse 9, he said to me, okay, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come forth from the four winds, which means he's calling down from heaven. O breath, and breathe on these that are dead, that are slain, that they may live. So again, he's obedient. I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath came into me. And they lived, and not only that, they stood an exceedingly great army. Look at the last part of verse 11. They indeed said, our bones are dry. See if this sounds anything like nowadays. Our hope is lost. What are we to live for? So we're cutting ourselves off. Suicide begins to, continues to grow in the young adult group. Suicide continues to grow in some of the ethnic groups. No hope. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord, Behold, O people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up from your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. Then you will know that I am the Lord. Verse 14. I will put my spirit in you and you shall live. And I will place you in your land. And then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, says the Lord. Look at verse 14 again. I will put my spirit in you and you shall live. Say it with me. I will put my spirit in you and you shall live. I will put my spirit in you and you shall live. And I will place you place you in your own land. As I mentioned, it's a familiar story. We've, I don't know, I've done three or four sermons out of that chapter. Never talked too much about verse 14 that I'm aware of. And this was a message to Israel that it's not too late. You can be changed. You can be redeemed. You can be called forth. I also want to just say that a lot of the Old Testament is a foreshadow. So let us just for a moment... Let us just think, could this be applying to the church of North America today? Do we have churches that are full of dry bones? Do we have churches with no breath of God in them anymore? Do we have churches that don't hear the word of the Lord anymore? The good news is, these bones can live again. In the last day when the revival begins to blow, there's going to be a word that comes out that is going to set captives free. It's going to allow people to begin to be released from their churches, from the bondage, from the new age nonsense that is taught in some of the churches, from even some of the stuff that I was hearing about this week that is just anti-God and yet it's being preached over our pulpits. And when churches begin to turn their back on Israel, we need churches that will stand up and come to life again. So I'm going to just for a moment, if I can, say that this chapter is a foreshadow. Even though it was written to Israel, I believe it's a foreshadow of what's going on in the churches around the world that have turned their back on the message of the gospel of hope. We should be giving a message of hope all over the world and to our neighbors and our friends. Charlene's got a neighbor whose husband committed suicide. 
I believe she's a Christian, but I'm sure her hope is shaken. I'm sure she's got questions that can't be answered. But the breath of God can blow into her. The church needs to be a place of hope. The church needs to be a healing center. The church needs to be a place where people can run to and sense the presence of God. The church needs to be a place where the word flows and we obey it and out of obedience as God lays on our heart. Lives are changed. This morning there's someone who had a dream and just, uh, we're going to pray about it at the end and it's just the word of the God just in Instead of written form or verbal form, just in picture form. But we're going to obey it and apply it because there's life in them, their bones. When the word of the Lord speaks. Verse 4 says, prophesy to them and in the anointed word by God, from God, life comes forth. God will often take you into difficult situations. God will often take you into places that there seems to be no way out. But with God, there's always a way out. Because God's word brings forth change. God's word brings forth hope. God's word brings forth the impossible out of nothing. Where there is no hope, hope shows up and his name is Jesus. Where there is no life, Jesus himself, the living bread and living water shows up. When the word becomes life and dwells, dwelt amongst us and still does. We need to have that message of hope. Amen? Yes. We need to be telling the world the good news of the gospel. That need, they need to hear the word of the Lord, and we need to have it in our being. It needs to be burning up in us. We need to have that passion to share the name of Jesus. But obedience is our key. I still remember that little couple different situations where people have gotten prophetic words to pray for to pray for that person they don't do it but god keeps bringing them around and i think it was al brown had the word to go in and, and pray for someone in a store and he said i don't have time and he went out and there was a detour and went out there's another detour and next thing you know he's back in the parking lot tried it again realized okay maybe i better obey what god's saying to do went in and god moved god is the divine restorer In this chapter in Ezekiel, there were many that were dead. Many who had died in captivity. Think of that thought. There was hundreds, if not thousands, if not millions of people who had died in captivity. And God is saying, I'm calling your bones forth. I'm calling you into life. How many in our generation, how many in our city are dying in their captivity? And they need you to set them free by the spoken word of Jesus Christ. I will give you new life. God looks over the valley, looks over our society and says, I will open up the graves and release you from your bondage. You thought you were dead in those things, but I want to speak life to you this morning. Then the Lord, the last part of that verse is, and I will give you a land. And it was the promised land, Israel. How many of us are walking in the promises and the full fulfillment that God has given to us? If you talk to some of the immigrants that have come to our nation over the years, they talk about that this is the promised land to them. God is restoring his church. He is about to do something awesome. That dam I had a picture of a couple years ago is about to burst forth. The river of God is about to flow. And he says, I will put my spirit in you so you can live. Church, we need to be living We need to be walking in truth, speaking truth, walking in authority, walking in power, but most of all, walking in love. It's great to have all the power, but if you don't have love, it doesn't matter. You're not concerned about those down the street. It doesn't matter. If you're not crying for people down the street, it doesn't matter. One of the best things I was told years ago, one of the hardest things, I didn't think he was hearing from the Lord for a while. But one of the best words of advice God said, if you're angry at someone, you'll know you're, you're on your way to healing when you can begin to pray for them in your prayer time. Man. You're all nodding, yep. Have you tried it? <laughs> if 
If I'm upset at George, putting him on my list first thing in the morning to pray for George, ooh, that's not first thing. <laughs> However, that's having the heart of God when you can start to do that. That shows that is the heart of God. I bet Jesus was broken when Judas finished his life because he's here for souls. I will put my spirit in you. There is victory ahead, declares the Lord. Ken, you can get the kids. Conquering those things that have kept you. Conquering those things that have kept you in chains and in bondage. But today the Lord says it stops because I put my spirit in you and I have restored you with a new heart, with a new vision, with a new passion. And I believe that's a prophetic word. That the Lord is about to release people from chains. And that there's graves about to be opened up. And the blind will see and the lame will walk. God is going to restore us with a new heart and a new passion. And a new beginning all in Him. It will all be done by Him. It will all be done through Him. It will all be because of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that Spirit that He said, I will give you the Holy Spirit... And fire. We all need to go through the fire. I was over at Joel's yesterday just dropping off a few things. And he's about to throw some things in the garbage. Old things. He's like a sister. He just throws stuff out. And I said, that is almost like an antique. And I'm pretty sure they're tin snips. Well, Dad, they're a little rusty. I said, here, but it's forged steel like this. So I started going through his garbage pail. Like, what are you doing? Like, <laughs> We need a new passion. A renewed heart. And it all begins in him. It will be done by him. It will be done through him. This morning we're going to do... Uh, I'd love to have you all come to the altar. But it's your choice. But we're going to pray for people this morning. And uh, we're going to put a song on, um, oh, have you got something? Okay, I'll trust Jeremy. He's always picking out good songs. But I want to pray, and I've asked the youth group and some others just to come and pray with people. And we're going to be praying that God will put life into you and that the fire of God will be released into your being. And that for some, it may just be stirring up that fire. There's sometimes... There were some people out burning some stuff. Joel had a little fire going, burning up twigs and stuff. And, and uh, you know what? There's sometimes you need a good bonfire. Sometimes you got a little fire. You can't cook much. But when the bonfire, the Holy Spirit shows up, all of a sudden, boom, things are changed. Things are removed out of you. I've seen at youth camp people who were alcoholics delivered. I've seen people who were drug addicts delivered in a moment. Others, it was months. But there's others when the power of God shows up, life's changed forever. So I'm just going to, uh, we're going to put this music on. We're just going to pray. I want to give time for the kids to come. And uh, we're going to pray for uh, you and your wife too. So you need to come up over on this side uh, when we open the altar. But I just want to invite you to come. Um, Bruce, if you can sort of organize lines if we get lines. And those that have been asked uh, to pray, would you come on down now as we kind of bow our heads and let's just prepare ourselves. Because I want God to do something this morning. These scriptures have been in my heart all week. And then when I'm watching Jason sing this morning, song after song after song had the the, the wind of the Spirit in it or had the fire of the Holy Spirit in it. And there are times when you begin to speak, you kind of wonder, what is this about? Like, am I on track? But then all of a sudden, it gets confirmed. And then someone comes up and says, I got something. And it's confirmed. And we just need to be asking God. So, And maybe you're in a good place. Maybe you think, hey, spiritually, I'm doing well. You know what? Just come and get the fire stoked a little bit. It's all good just to get prayed for. So I would encourage you, you know... Why don't you just take a moment and and think about it?